AUKUS Alliance plan to monitor deep space is a cover program for secret space program activities. Reptilian Vatican connection is a secret hidden in plain sight. Investigating alien abduction attempts in Peru, an interview with Timothy Alberino. The BBC is making a feature film on Gary McKinnon's hacking into NASA Pentagon computers. Colonel Philip Corso's testimony on UFO crash debris and meeting with an extraterrestrial is featured on the Weaponized podcast. A diluted version of the UAP Disclosure Act has been accepted by the Reconciliation Committee for the National Defense Authorization Act for 2024. JP has a new update. Nordics take control of space arcs and reveal disturbing timelines for the Earth Alliance. Those stories and more on Exopolitics Today, the week in review. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome to the Week in Review for December 9, and it definitely has been a busy week, especially concerning news over the UAP Disclosure Act. So we will get to that. So I want to begin with my first tweet or X now. And for just to remind you, you can go to twitter.com forward slash Michael Sala, and you'll see my Twitter feed. So I want to begin with this uh, tweet in terms of uh, what's the true goal of the AUKUS Alliance's plan to monitor deep space with high-powered radar by 2030. So what is really going on there? Now, as far as uh, classified programs are concerned, there's always a cover program for the more highly classified secret space program activities. So in this case, this plan that's been announced for a high-powered radar to monitor deep space using radar installations that are going to be triangulated from uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, and the USA, that is a cover program for a monitoring, intercept, and attack space uh, system uh, that would be used to attack spacecraft either belonging to other secret space program activities or extraterrestrial motherships that park themselves in earth orbit and this is uh, something that is very uh, significant in terms of defending the strategic high, high ground space is the strategic high ground now and the cis lunar region that's all the area uh, between the Earth and the Moon, including the Moon. And if you if you imagine a big sphere around the Earth, where the outermost edge of that sphere is the Moon, that is the cislunar region. And this high-powered radar system, I believe, is a cover program for developing some kind of planetary defense system using installations that are going to be situated in uh, Pine Gap, Australia, uh, the uh, United Kingdom and the US, which can be triangulated to shoot at things uh, using directed energy weapons and other uh, weapon systems uh, anywhere in that region and beyond. So there's a preview clip of my webinar from November 25, the good, the bad ET exopolitical state of the planet preview clip. So in this preview clip, I discuss how third parties manipulate both sides in international conflicts to start or perpetuate wars. And so I look at the Israel-Palestine conflict that's happening now and say how that has been manufactured by third parties that are manipulating both the Palestinians and the Israelis to go at it. Uh, and so this is important to acknowledge that this has been going on for a long time and researchers such as William Bramley and David Icke were among the first to expose that. Uh, Jim Mars also 
expose that system where you have a third party intervening in international conflicts to manipulate both sides. So there's no true binary conflict that ever happens. I mean, people think in binary terms, in terms of uh, conflicts, you know, whether it's Pakistan versus India, versus whether it's the United States versus Iran or, or Ukraine versus Russia or Israel versus Palestine. People or scholars in international politics often think in binary terms that, you know, that's really what's going on. But you need to look at the third party behind the scenes. And that's not just extremists in both sides. I mean, a lot of people will say, for example, well, you know, there's the extremist faction of the Palestinians, the Hamas, or the extremist faction of the Israelis, and, and that's, say, the Likud party uh, that are behind uh, this latest outbreak in fighting. But no, these, these extremists are typically figureheads that are used, exploited by, by the true third party, which is extraterrestrial. So that's the clip that explains that. Okay, so this is where you get to see how the reptilian Vatican connection is hidden in plain sight. I mean, it's right there in front of you. I mean, you look at some of the artwork. I mean, here's, here's the artwork where you have some kind of reptilian-like being with one of the popes. And so Elena Danan uh, posted this, and she th thought that this this alluded to a contract being signed with one of the winged Sakaar. Was it the Pindar that was rumoured to be hiding below the Vatican? Well, the connection between the reptilians and the Vatican is a long one. Uh, it goes back a long time, and so this artwork typifies that. As far as the Pindar is concerned, the Pindar is typically the appointed representative for the reptilian or the Dracos. Up until, uh, I think it was the early 1820s, the Pindar was the Pope uh, because the Pope represented a figure that had powerful influence over the nation states of Europe and the Americas. But in the eight, uh, early 1800s, I think it was around 1850, uh, the Pope, the Vatican became dependent on the Rothschild family. And the Rothschilds made a huge loan to, to the Vatican. And he who controls the money supply controls uh, the recipients or the targets. Uh, and so the, the Popes then became subordinate to the Rothschilds as far as uh, their dependence on the Rothschilds for funding is concerned. And so that apparently was when the Pindar uh, became associated with the Rothschilds. So the, the Pindar is typically a hybrid reptilian human uh, that attains very high office and they infiltrate all institutions. So the Vatican Church has always been Oh, the Vatican has been infiltrated for a long time. Uh, these hybrids reach uh, very high positions as cardinals or as popes, and they're manipulated. Then the 1800s come along. Uh, now it's it's uh, who controls the banks that is the the most important institution. And so the Pindar is someone that now comes from the Rothschild banking family. Here's another story. Let's go to Daniel Sheehan, uh, who is a longtime UFO disclosure attorney. He identifies key individuals, agencies, and corporations attempting to defang the UAP Disclosure Act for 2023. So I'll go into exactly what happened. But in this article with uh, Christopher Sh uh, Sharp, uh, Christopher Sharp analyzes Sheehan's claims about the different parties involved in the battle over the fate of the UAP Disclosure Act that was that took place this, this week. So what was interesting is that in this article, he identified some of the corporations that were involved in the kind of uh, lobbying of the rep Republican representatives that came out strongly against passage of the UAP Act as it is currently worded. And so uh, the representatives, Mike Turner from the intelligence community, uh, the, the intelligence committee, 
uh, that's the House of Representatives Intelligence Committee, and Mike Rogers, who heads the uh, House's uh, the House of Representatives Armed Services Committee. Both of them are beholden to the to the uh, major corporations. And so here is something that's very interesting: that these are the corporations that make these large contributions to the re-election campaigns of congressmen and Mike Rogers and Mike Turner, uh, they have received a lot of money from these corporations. And Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and now Radiance Technologies, that they have in their possession some of these crashed UFO material. And they did not want the UAP Act to be passed as it was currently um, worded. And so they arranged for the for the gutting of that. And so this article uh, in, by the, in the Liberation Time exposes five powerful Republicans blocking the UFO Disclosure Act. And so now we know who they are. I've mentioned a few, a few of them. I recommend this article to kind of like get the full story on, on who, who these people are. Now we go to... The next story, which was a interview I did with Timothy Alberino, who came back in, uh, he did a investigation in late October, beginning of November, of the alien abduction attempts in Peru. So this is my interview with him, and and Timothy, he is someone who does field work, which is kind of rare in uh, the UFO. Uh, field. I mean, it is actually difficult to do field work when it comes uh, to you, your UFOs. The best you can do is to travel to the homes of whistleblowers or contactees and interview them. Um, so this was something that Timothy Alberino did. He travelled to Peru's Amazon region. It's an area he knows well. He spent um, at least a decade there as as a missionary, working there with his um, parents. Um, and uh, doing his own work there. And he knows the local uh, legends and the language, the um, local uh, dialect of Spanish there, and he speaks it very well. So he was able to go there and question uh, dozens of witnesses firsthand. Uh, also, he was able to supply the villagers. Uh, he took some supplies with him, which was very impressive. So he was able to get the firsthand story of what really went down with these craft or these uh, beings that were trying to abduct people. And as you can see in this uh, banner here, you can see uh, these people on two people on what looks like a flying hoverboard or a flying circular platform. Uh, these people, uh, they were they wore full body armor. And they were the ones attempting to abduct some teenagers. So he spoke with one of the abductees, uh, a female, and she identified them and, and, and heard them speaking. And she identified them speaking Spanish. And and Timothy Alberino, after he interviewed, as I said, uh, many other witnesses that were there, that saw what was going on, took shots at these beings, uh, Timothy's uh, conclusion is that these are not extraterrestrials. Uh, he believes that these are part of some uh, highly classified program using uh, technologies that are not publicly available. I mean, certainly full body armor suits are available, but these flying platforms and also shoes with some kind of uh, small sphere below it, which allows one to, to levitate, that was also a uh, part of this. So uh, yeah, well worth listening to that interview just so you, you get a, a good idea that what's happening in Peru is part of some kind of psychological operation involving personnel that are part of a secret space program using highly classified technologies that are not publicly available to terrify the population and to create the foundation for, for something. And in the past and in the interview, we talked about a possible false flag event. So this could, this could easily morph into something like that. 
So that's my uh, story with our t uh, interview with Timothy Albrino. So the audio book version of uh, US Army Insider Missions 2 is now available. Very happy to announce that. So you get to hear JP and I. I mean, we I did have a company produce the audio book. And so you have uh, an actor uh, doing the the voice, the narratives for both JP and myself. Uh, the, the simplest reason was that I didn't think I would do a good job trying to imitate JP. And so it was better to get someone to do, who could do both. So anyway, so that audio book is available uh, on amazon.com and also audible.com. So just go to US Armour. U.S. Army Insider Missions 2, and you will be able to get a copy. So next we go to this story that just came out on December 4, that Gary McKinnon's uh, experience after hacking into the NASA and Pentagon computers is going to be made into a film, a documentary-style film. Now, he has gone public, he went public um, you know, well over a decade ago saying that he saw a number of things on the computers, on the screens. And, uh, and he, unfortunately, this was back in 2002, they didn't have screenshot um, available at the time and download speeds were very, uh, were very slow. So that was the big problem. But he says he saw a spreadsheet of fleet-to-fleet -fleet transfers, um, also of non-terrestrial Officers. He also saw a picture, an image of a large cigar shaped spacecraft. And, you know, because he was prosecuted by the US and the extradition attempt took well over a decade, it made world news. And so it is a, a really compelling story. And because the Pentagon went after him with a vengeance, or the Department of Justice went after him with a vengeance, saying that he compromised security, uh, that is definitely a very important kind of thing to keep in mind. And, and one of the things that is worth acknowledging here is that around the same time that McKinnon hacked into the Pentagon and NASA computers, uh, after after he was discovered, uh, around the same time, US Space Command was demoted, was hidden within, it was demoted from one of the, from its then status as one of the major combatant commands to being a subordinate command within the, within a, a strategic command. So I think, think that what McKinnon did w had kind of like cast light on these security vulnerabilities in the secret space program. And so Space Command, as it was then constituted, uh, was demoted. And so that did have real life implications. And of course, Space Command, 17 years later, that's in 2019, was resurrected under uh, President Donald Trump. And it is expanding in terms of multinational alliances, and I'll talk about that uh, soon. So here's uh, Senator Chuck Schumer calling out a group of Republicans who are trying to scuttle the UAP Disclosure Act despite overwhelming bipartisan support. So this is very interesting. What, why, is, why of all people was Chuck Schumer behind the UAP Disclosure Act? Now, he is as deep state as they come. So why would he be supporting UFO disclosure? I, I think it's probably because he, he didn't really want UFO disclosure, and he probably proposed this knowing that it would be shot down. I mean, Schumer's been around for decades, so he knows the way Congress operates. And he put out a uh, this UAP Disclosure Act, which on when you look at it, it was very impressive in terms of uh, having in there the creation of this uh, nine-man agency that would uh, have the power of subpoena, that could use eminent domain to get control over uh, spacecraft that were being studied secretly in various corporations or anywhere. 
And Schumer, I think he probably knew that there was no way that this would pass. But he he proposed it, and he played the white knight. He played the role of the white knight, as as did others. And and um, you know, Schumer, he is associated with John Podesta and Hillary Clinton. And yeah, you know, they have long advocated UFO disclosure in the past. And and in the past, I I was one of those that thought that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta that they were uh, good actors because they were in support of uh, UFO disclosure. Well, then of course in 2016, uh, the the whole thing with Seth Rich and uh, Pizzagate happened, and as the truth came out, uh, we learned more about what these people were really doing. And I think that UFO disclosure is really just a tool that these uh, deep state actors use to manipulate the public or to distract the public. So I, I think Schumer knew quite well in putting in proposing this UAP Act uh, that it would be shot down. And it was a very good distraction and still is a good distraction because people, people in the UFO community are talking about it nonstop. It has kind of framed uh, Pedestra, sorry, it has framed Schumer and others supporting it in a positive light and has kind of like made uh, these Republicans that uh, acted on behalf of the corporations look really bad. And uh, so, yeah, I think that was a very clever uh, ploy uh, by Schumer. So here's a episode on Weaponized. Uh, Weaponized is a podcast with uh, uh, George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell, and they have a lot of very interesting film footage that George Knapp has acquired over the decades, and uh, Jeremy Corbell is a, a videographer as well. So this in this film footage, they showed uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Colonel Philip Corso talking about the Roswell UFO crash debris he encountered at the Pentagon and meeting with an alien at White Sands Missile Range. So the, the videos were uh, from 1996-1997, and uh, they discuss, uh, Knapp and Corbell discuss the implications of Corso's claims that some of the Roswell debris, uh, debris were used in classified reverse engineering uh, projects uh, that were sponsored by the U.S. Army. Okay, so this is where we get into some very interesting differences in terms of um, what George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell are putting out there. So they totally supported what uh, Corso had to say about uh, seeding some of these technologies into the civilian world, into corporations, so that you had the th you had things like um, Kevlar uh, fabrics being developed. Uh, you you had uh, microchips, you had uh, night vision goggles and other advanced technologies that were derived or back-engineered from the debris recovered at Roswell and that Corso would identify corporations working in areas where they were already kind of like moving in the right direction. But once they saw the actual technology, that would help them uh, you know, rapidly, uh, in, more rapidly progress in terms of developing that, that technology. So, so that was what Corso did. Now, Knapp makes a comment in this uh, episode of Weaponized that I think is well worth looking at closely. His comment is that uh, the propulsion systems of crashed UFOs have not been successfully reverse engineered. So that is consistent with uh, what people like uh, Bob Lazar and David Grush and other witnesses or whistleblowers that Michael Schellenberger have said, that all of the narrative that has come forward from these whistleblowers that have talked to various reporters or members of Congress that even appeared in Congress in July 26th of this year, uh, the narrative that's coming forward is that, yes, corporations have in their possession crashed UFOs and some non-human biologics, but they have had trouble reverse engineering these technologies. So you know, that is the position of a lot of people now that are supporting David Grush. But in my research and my work with uh, 
secret space program insiders, that is incorrect. That, in fact, these technologies have been successfully reverse engineered, that extraterrestrials helped the US military and corporations in the reverse engineering efforts. And this has been, uh, these secret space programs have been in operation since the nine, at least the 1970s, if not earlier. Okay, so another thing that I thought was very interesting is that uh, Philip Corso, in an interview he did with uh, Michael Lindemann, said that he gave briefings to Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General in the Kennedy administration. And so Kennedy, as Attorney General, was then briefing his brother, the President, on what Corso had been revealing. So Everything that Corso said in this testimony uh, to uh, Knapp and uh, to Knapp in the interview, all of that and more was being revealed to Robert Kennedy and, and through Kennedy to President Kennedy. So Kennedy knew that the army was sitting on some crashed UFO debris, that they were seeding uh, corporations with these technologies, and that there were extraterrestrials that had been landing on Earth and that personnel were meeting with them. So they knew, so Kennedy knew all this. So this gives us a more of an understanding or a, a better context on why it was that President Kennedy pushed so hard to have the CIA disclose classified UFO files in his possession. And I discussed that in my book, Kennedy's Last Stand. So you get all the information there. So yes, I think uh, Philip Corso. Very important testimony, so I'm glad Knapp and Corbell put it out on their weaponized podcast. So Elena Danan has started doing a weekly uh, Star News, Star Nation News update. And I think it's really necessary viewing for anyone wanting to understand the big picture. I know Elena Danan is a contactee and some people say, well, where's the evidence? Where's the film footage and so forth? How do we know for certain? Uh, using corroborating evidence from other insiders, circumstantial evidence, uh, the testimony of uh, legitimate insiders corroborating key aspects of what Elena Danan has said. I, I, I believe her Star Nation news is being watched by people within the classified world. So if they're watching it, you should be watching it. Even if you still feel that, okay, there's not enough evidence to this, you should watch it and digest it to get an understanding of the big picture. Because you're not going to get that from a lot of UFO researchers because they don't look at uh, contactees. And as I've always said, you want to get the big picture of what's going on, you've got to go beyond just witness testimonies and whistleblowers, you've got to look at the contactees. So uh, here she relayed a message from uh, Enki or Ia about conventional religions limiting human potential versus connecting directly with source energy. So this is something that uh, Ia or I Enki talked about in a message that he gave to Elena Danan and she relayed it in her Star Nation news. And so you get to a sense that uh, Ia is someone that is very much in support of people being able to connect with source energy themselves and believes that conventional religions are really uh, a means of kind of uh, limiting people's uh, innate potentials. In other words, conventional religions are all about dogma, whereas seeking one's source energy is all about going within. And this is something that all the mystics have always talked about. I mean, you talk. there's a difference between exoteric religion and esoteric religion. So if we're talking about the mystics, whether it's uh, from Sufism, whether it's from uh, in, uh, Indian uh, Vedic philosophies, Buddhism, uh, Christian spirituality, they always talk about going within and connecting with the light within, which is then part of this oneness that makes up the, univ up the universal whole. So... I mean, of course, that there's it's much more nuance than that, and it, it's, there's variations depending on the traditions. But they all these spiritual traditions talk about going within, which is exactly what Ia says he did. He taught. So it's like, well, Ia is communicating that he's like the mystic, the alchemist, saying go within, transformed the lead of human desire 
into the gold of connection with divine source. Whereas exoteric religion is all about dogma. It's all about believing these dogmas and, and going to war against others because their dogma is different to your dogmas or your religious beliefs systems are different to theirs. So I think it's a very important point and it's going to become more and more relevant because uh, I think as we move into a post-disclosure world, as the extraterrestrials start revealing themselves, we're going to realize that conventional religions are just full of dogma that really do not help people connect with their innate abilities and power within. Because if you want to connect with extraterrestrials, you need to find that place of power within yourself and you go within to do it. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, quoting scripture or asserting dogma, if you're meeting an eight foot tall reptilian, it's not going to help you very much. So, yeah, definitely take a look at uh, Elena Danan, uh, her Star, Star Nation News. So here's a, a research tool for those wanting to dig into UFO case history. And this uh, this is uh, something that comes from uh, APRO, which we, is a, a long time, uh, that's the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization uh, that... Uh, existed in the 1960s, and so they developed a huge database of case studies into UFOs going all the way back to the 1950s and so forth. And for those studying the UFO phenomenon, uh, it's well worth looking at this uh, collection. Uh, this uh, is a longtime researcher, Isaac Coy from Britain. So he has created a website where he has... Uh, put up their microfilms of uh, APRO files, uh, and these are available for, for free online. So it's an incredible database. You can go there and you see all of these incredible newspaper stories going back to the 1950s. And it gives you a, a lot of context of, of, of what was being reported back then. Because in some ways in the 1950s and 60s, uh, there was greater openness on the UFO issues. So you can definitely get uh, a, a lot of information about what was going on there. So that's a handy research tool. Okay, so let's go here. Okay, so here's the... Okay, so news began to come out uh, during the week that the fate of the UAPO, UAP Disclosure Act was not good. So here was a analysis of one of the claims by Daniel Sheehan. And Daniel Sheehan, I mean, he's been around uh, the UFO field for um, several decades now. He was the attorney for the Disclosure Project under Stephen Greer. And in the, I believe it was in, it was during the Carter White House that he went and had access to the Library of Congress to some of their UFO files because he was uh, tasked to do so as part of a some kind of disclosure initiative associated with the Jesuits and the uh, Carter White House. So he has made the claim that the Biden White House was supporting the passage of the UAP, Dis uh, UAP Disclosure Act that according to Sheehan, that uh, Chuck Schumer thought that the passage of the act was, quote, the solution to the UFO issue. Um, so this was, I, th I think this was kind of like um, setting up the profile of UFOs. I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really don't believe now that Chuck Schumer proposed the UIP Disclosure Act intending for it to be passed. I think it, he just dangled it, threw it out there as a carrot and really did nothing to support its passage. And that is substantiated by the analysis of uh, uh, Dean Johnson, who, who really is a very uh, solid investigator of congressional and White House activities. And so he examined uh, Danny Sheehan's claims about the White House supporting this and that there was a real fight in Congress to support the passage of the UAP Act. And, and what he found instead, that there was a lack 
of interest, that the Democrats in, in particular, key de- Democrats who you would have thought would support their leader in passing this UIP Act did nothing. And so, you know, this supports uh, the idea that uh, the UIP Act was was just put out there by Deng, uh, by um, Chuck Schumer, knowing that it would that it would fail. And so, you know, why is that? Um, and so, yeah, I proposed that while it was setting the stage for possibly a false flag alien event, so you you dangle the carrot of your full UFO disclosure. It's it's withdrawn or scuttled, or in this case, as we saw, it was essentially just uh, defanged of of all its teeth, and and so it does nothing. But it, what it did do was direct public attention towards UAPs and their public. So now millions of people, tens of millions of people in the United States are thinking about UAPs because of this UAP Disclosure Act that uh, Chuck Schumer proposed or put forward and for well over a month now it's been discussed relentlessly so it's rather it's raised the profile of ufos and the existence of non-human intelligence so why did schumer do that why did the deep state do this some possible explanations a false flag alien event a catastrophic dis, a catastrophic disclosure or a long drawn out fight over ufo disclosure in the us congress so all of these are possibilities uh, that we need to look at. So let's look at some other stories. So, so finally, um, on December seven, it emerged that a um, a bicameral a conference committee that comprised the ranking members of the defence. Uh, Armed Services uh, Committees from the Senate and the House of Representatives that this Reconciliation Committee that was headed by these four individuals, the ranking members of the Armed Services Committees from both, along with others that came in and addressed this um, uh, conference committee, that they decided to scuttle or dilute the uh, UAP Disclosure Act that was that had been passed by the US Senate. And so the diluted version uh, doesn't create a review board, so that's gone. There's no subpoena power to access, uh, no subpoena power to access uh, records, wh- whether they are in any kind of corporation or whether they're in any um, uh, agency that doesn't exist. Eminent domain was removed. And so the big takeaway from this, I think, is that uh, newer companies like SpaceX can forget about getting their hands on the UFO debris that older companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop, Grumman and so forth have in their possession and that they've been reverse engineering these for for decades. And uh, under the original UAP Disclosure Act, they would have been compelled to uh, hand those over. So this is the tweet that Curious Explorer uh, put out uh, that analysed the uh, the conference report put out by this um, reconciliation committee. Uh, they also uh, preserved the funding uh, uh, amendment. Or this is the Gillibrand amendment. They preserved the the one aspect that prohibited prohibited funds from being used on any UAP program unless disclosed to the congressional leadership at Intel and Armed Services Committee. So, you know, that really doesn't amount to too much uh, because even if you disclose these programs to ranking members in these committees, I mean, there's no guarantee they're ever going to say anything about it. I mean, we saw that uh, with regard to the David Grush testimony. I mean, David Grush went to the uh, Senate and House uh, Armed Services and Intelligence Committees to give uh, briefings about what he knew of, of up to 40 whistleblowers, and no no one, no member of these committees has come forward. And in fact, uh, Tim Burchett, the uh, Republican con- congressman who uh, arranged for uh, Grush to appear in this July 26 uh, congressional hearing, he pointed out 
he has said subsequently that people within the arms within the intelligence and armed services committees they kind of see themselves as as privileged because they have higher security classification and have higher access or need to know when it comes to these programs and they don't share it they don't share it with other members of congress so yeah so this this really this gillibrand amendment doesn't uh, doesn't mean ma much at all uh, so yes yeah, so this this is uh, a good summary of the things that were taken out and this is uh, the curious explorer uh, twitter feed okay so jp did a update that was released on uh, december 7 and in this update he talks about the space arcs uh, being taken over by nordics and uh, so this is something that uh, JP has said that the space arc, the Atlantic space arc, was being relocated into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and made inaccessible uh, to to surface humanity. That was incredibly that was increasingly worshipping these technologies. In other words, the the different governments of the world that were collaborating in some way. I mean, they had problems in how they interacted with these technologies. Um, and, and the Nordics thought that uh, the humans were worshipping these technologies too much. That, uh, and also there was some some level of competition. So, JP said that he was taken on this spacecraft, and uh, he was told about uh, what was happening with the space arcs being taken under the control of the nordics and he was given a drink and this blue drink that uh, jp had the actual name of the nordic uh, it's incorrect here it's not yusuf he he it's actually phonetically it's pronounced uh jasif jasif j-a-s-i-f um and so that's that is the name of the nordic and so jp is saying that uh, this Nordic is very concerned about uh, the way in which the space arcs are being uh, treated and also very concerned especially about the timelines, the possible timelines that uh, humans may be heading into if the right decisions are not made. So I think what that means and a lot of people were kind of worried about this like well does is jp saying we're headed for some negative timelines or nordics saying that this is what's happening what i think is going on is that right now the nordics are monitoring human consciousness and they're monitoring events on the planet and they're seeing how things are playing out right now because the white hats have not made their big move the white hats have not come out to expose the corruption, to expose the um, stolen elections, expose the kind of false flag events, expose uh, the the framing of Russia. Um, all of these things have not been exposed. And so the Nordics are looking at all this in terms of future timelines and, as, and are very concerned about the possibilities of what may happen if the White Hats don't make their moves soon so i think that's what's going on so I don't, I don't think it's a cause to be concerned about at the moment but certainly it's a warning that things can quickly get out of hand if uh, the white hats don't assert control soon uh, and the white hats asserting control you know we can't we can't control that but what we can control are our thoughts and actions. And, uh, and this is one of the things that JP asserts again and again, as well as others. We can get into that place of higher frequency, higher vibration, where we are not buffeted, not, not going into depression or fear, anxiety, as things start to move in a negative direction, that we are the ones that are kind of like leading, playing a leadership role you know, through our posts, through our interactions with others. So I do have another update with JP, and JP, in this other update, it's going to be released. We, we aim to release it next week. That's what uh, 
our, our goal is. So we, we plan to have it out by next Thursday. And in this other update, just to give you a teaser, uh, JP is is uh, saying that the Nordics have taken control of all the space arcs, not just the Atlantic space arc. They've taken control and they're restricting access uh, to the humans because, you know, put sh uh, simply we haven't got our shit together. Uh, that... Uh, there's a lot of fighting. I mean, you just look at the world right now. There's a lot of infighting, and it's getting worse. And so we got to really cooperate, and the Nordics are wanting us to cooperate before we get our hands on these advanced technologies. So uh, the Nordics are, are taking control. Uh, so very interesting. So you you can look forward to that coming out next Thursday if all goes well. Okay, so here's something that I thought was very interesting. This is that Italy, Japan, and Norway have just joined the combined the, the combined space operations initiatives, which is this cooperation between the space commands or the equivalent military commands in different nations that they all cooperate. And US Space Command is at the center of that. So US Space Command is a basically coordinating its equivalent space commands from other nations to form a multinational space alliance, a multinational military alliance. So this this combined space operations in initiative currently consists of 10 nations. So the other six nations are Australia, Canada, France, Germany, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. So these uh, countries all coordinate their military operations in space, and they have a very important function, which is that as they coordinate all their space assets, so to varying extents, these countries all have space programs, and uh, they co are coordinating their, their space programs increasingly. And as the Artemis Accords uh, start to take shape and we actually have civilian space programs as the 2020s go into the 2030s and many nations have functional space activities, whether it's space mining, space research, setting up space bases, space tourism, whatever it is, and they're signatories to the Artemis Accords. The Artemis Accords have within them a provision uh, for the creation of safety zones. That means that if a uh, companies or signatories to the Artemis Accords and, co and co corporations associated with these, if they are doing uh, a sensitive mining program or setting up a base somewhere, and that's declared a safety zone, that means that this combined space operations initiative is obliged to protect that. So what we are seeing really is the creation of something along the lines of a Starfleet similar to what appeared in Star Trek. And also uh, another important aspect of this um, combined space operations uh, initiative is that they coordinate with the extraterrestrial civilizations that are monitoring and interacting with Earth civilizations. So the, whether we're talking about the Galactic Federation of Worlds, the Ashtar Command, the Andromeda Council, the Council of uh, Seven, I believe it is now, that all of these coordinate with the uh, US Space Command and also with, which is heading this combined space operations in initiative. And the goal is to ensure the smooth running of our solar system and the responsible use of ancient technologies to make sure that there's not a space race or, 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 or wars or conflict over the discovery and utilization of these uh, space arcs and technologies, ancient technologies. It's, it's to try to coordinate all the Earth nations to work together and to use these to, to benefit all the, all the members of this alliance. So it's very important. Uh, this combined space operations initiative is going to evolve into a future Starfleet, whatever it's called, whether it's Starfleet, whether it's called Earth Alliance, 
it'll be the functional equivalent of Starfleet. So very important to understand that. Okay, so I did a um, interview on Redacted where I discussed the gutting of the UIP Disclosure Act and its, repl and its replacement with the, uh, this UIP records collection in the National Archives. So what I said was that the plan to pass a UIP Disclosure Act, which was really, in fact, a controlled disclosure initiative. That's what it was. Some people were very suspicious from the get-go, saying that, well, we don't trust this controlled disclosure initiative. All it's going to do is delay things you know, 25 years and so forth. Uh, yeah, there, there's some truth to that, but there was also a lot of truth to the, to the fact that this was a controlled disclosure initiative where a lot of the secret technologies that were secretly being studied in corporate laboratories, that some of that could have been brought out into the public sector using the power of, of eminent, dem eminent domain. Uh, and so what's happened is that this UIP Disclosure Act has been gutted, and what we have instead is a UIP records collection that will be established in the, in the National Archives. So elements of the UIP Disclosure Act were preserved, and the elements that were preserved constitute the establishment of a UAP records collection within the National Archives. The original idea was that this records collection would be pretty extensive because you would have a review board that would probe government agencies and corporations with record for records and artifacts and any knowledge that would then be relayed to the National Archives and to the records collection. So, in other words, uh, without this review board, this UIP review board, there, there's no way that this uh, records collection is going to amount to very much at all. It's, essentially, it's just going to be just more of what we're seeing under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act, agencies are always being asked through FOIA requests to release these things. Uh, uh, the Black Vault uh, with John Greenewald, he's done really excellent work in using FOIA to extract records. Uh, but without the uh, passage, without the creation of a review board with subpoena power, the power of eminent domain, uh, the power to, uh, to go to the president directly to disclose this rather than being subordinate to uh, the Pentagon bureaucracy, without that, then you're you're not going to have much released at all, and so and and as people who have experience with uh, the FOIA Act, and I've I've had a little bit of experience with that, have found uh, the, for, when you make these requests with FOIA, it's time consuming, and you often get very very little. Okay, so here's a a reaction by Ross Coltart and Bryce Zabel to the gutting of the UIP Disclosure Act. And that, that um, you know, the remnants of it that was this, uh, incorporated into the 2024 uh, uh, National Defence Authorization Act. So they spell out what's wrong with this, and I've already gone over it, so I don't, I don't want to repeat uh, what uh, I've already said, but what I thought was worth pointing out that uh, Ross Coltart, he made an interesting statement. He, he said that uh, he was very much in agreement that uh, the UOP Disclosure Act was uh, gutted for reasons I, I just explained. He made similar arguments. But then he said something that was kind of like uh, debated, and I, I wanted to kind of take issue with it as well because he said that he had uh, sympathy for the aerospace corporations uh, resistance or antipathy over the eminent domain elements of the proposed UAP Disclosure Act uh, because he thought that the uh, corporations had spent vast amounts of money finding these crashed UFOs and bringing them to the laboratories and studying them. Well, I, I think Ross Coulter hasn't been around long enough to, to maybe know that there have been crash retrieval operations set up uh, that are run by the Air Force, by the CIA, 
by the NRO and that they have had specialist teams in place recruiting personnel from the military that go into the field. And when they retrieve the debris, they take a first look at it. They have corporate consultants often take a look at it. And then eventually they hand it off to the corporations for study and reverse engineering. That has been the way it works so it's not a matter of the corporations going there finding these ufos and then taking them into the laboratories they always get the the debris from these crash these elite crash investigation teams that have been set up under taxpayer funding with using personnel from the uh, air force or now space force and or the national reconnaissance office the CIA also, and then whatever is retrieved is then handed off to the corporations. So the corporations have been getting these technologies for free, really, and being told, take a look at it. So they don't own it. This is why the power of eminent domain is important, why it needs to be passed, because that's the only way you'll get the corporations uh, to let go of these technologies. Um, and without that eminent domain they can't release it so so this is so this is where we get to okay so the uip disclosure act has been gutted it's presently being voted up upon uh, in the u.s senate then it's going to go to the house and then it'll be passed the, in a in its incorporation in the National Defence Authorization Act. So that'll be passed uh, before the end of the year and will be signed into law. So that is that is playing out. So this uh, UAP records collection uh, is all that's essentially uh, remaining. Um, so what's going to happen? Well, people have been pointing out, well, without a controlled disclosure initiative, what you're going to have now is an uncontrolled or what is called a catastrophic disclosure of some kind. So what kind of catastrophic disclosure can we expect? Well, I think there are three possibilities that can come to mind in terms of what is likely to happen. Um, first, there's going to be a flood of credible whistleblowers coming forward to talk about what they know of these retrieved UFOs and non-human intelligence biological material from them that they worked on in these classified programs. So I think we're going to have a flood of these. So we're going to have uh, David Grush on steroids because David Grush, he did not have first-hand involvement in these programs himself. Uh, he knows of people who did, and these are people that are, that are going to come forward. Now, one of the people that I know that are part of these classified programs is uh, JP, the Army Insider that I've been, been working with since 2008 and, and joined the US Army in 2019. He's got direct access. He could come forward and be part of this. I, I do not know whether he will be allowed to do this, uh, whether how long he's even going to be allowed to remain in the military. Uh, we This is all very fluid uh, you know jp has been subject subjected to a number of attacks um he, he's been hospitalized several times very recently as well and so it's taking a toll on him so he is definitely uh you know, wanting that to end so if j well we'll we'll see what happens with jp in the future but uh, for the moment jp is someone who has first-hand experience there are many others that are willing to come forward. And this, I think, is going to be very interesting over the next uh, year. A second possibility of a false flag alien event. I, I personally, I think that this is something that probably is a very real possibility now that uh, the UAP issue has been raised to such prominence. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Chuck Schumer, Deep State, I think he knew the UIP Disclosure Act was going to be shot down, but he proposed it anyway because he knew that the attention that it would generate would prepare the public for a false flag alien event of some kind. It doesn't have to be a full-fledged full, 
full-blown alien invasion it could be something much more mysterious something along the lines of what we're seeing in peru right now so peru what we're seeing there could be the template for some kind of false flag alien event where it's like you don't know who who's really doing all the all these dastardly things but something like what we're witnessing in peru could be magnified at a high level and and the third possibility is that uh, extraterrestrial motherships from the cedars from the 24 civilizations could show themselves the space arcs could start showing up as well so these are three possibilities that i think uh we might witness next year so let's see i think it's going to be a, a fascinating year i think the stage has been set ladies and gentlemen for some really monumental events and i will do my best to cover the stories as they unfold on my x feed or twitter feed and uh share with you uh breaking news uh, on a weekly basis and of course uh through the interviews uh on my exopolitics today podcast so don't forget to subscribe on exopolitics today uh i have a mail list on exopolitics.org or exopoliticstoday.com so you can subscribe to the email list and that way you'll be notified of everything that comes forward so thank you for listening and aloha you have been listening to exopolitics today with dr michael sala please remember to like share and subscribe to this channel Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.